Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston, and today we're going to learn all about derivatives. So in the previous lecture, we already talked about derivatives a fair bit, but we mostly focused on its theoretical properties, okay? What its definition is, what it represents about a function, and sort of what it means in terms of the graph of the function. In this class instead, what we're going to look at now is how to compute it, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a whole bunch of rules for computing derivatives of different types of functions. So let's get to it. Okay, so, well, again, in the previous lecture, we already looked at one derivative rule. We looked at something called the power rule, which said that if your function was just a power function, some function of the form x to the power of a constant, then its derivative, right, remember f prime means derivative of f, what is it, what it is, is n times x to the power n minus 1, okay, where n was your original exponent, now that exponent comes out in front, and the exponent gets decreased by 1. Okay, but this raises a very big question. What if your function is not a power function? What if it is not of the form x to the power n, right? There are lots of other func functions out there. For example, what is the derivative of the sine function? Or the cos function, for that matter? Or other trigonometric functions like tan or secant or cosecant and all those? What is the derivative of e to the x? What is the derivative of ln of x? Okay, what are the derivatives of all of these other functions that we've been working with? Okay, so those are the types of things that we're going to look at in this class. And in particular, I'm just going to give you the answers to all of these questions. Okay, I'm just going to give you a table that tells you, hey, derivative of this function is this, derivative of this function is this, and so on. Okay, so first row is just, well, what's the derivative of a function of the form x to the power n, where again, n is a constant. Well, that's just the power rule, right? We already learned that. The derivative is n times x to the power n minus 1. Okay, what about, well, what if your function's a constant? What if f of x just equals c, some constant, for all x, regardless of what x is? Well, then the derivative, I claim that the derivative is zero. Okay, and hopefully that makes some sort of intuitive sense if you remember what a derivative is. A derivative, it's a rate of change. It describes how quickly that function is changing. Okay, well, this function, a constant function, it's constant, it doesn't change. So what is its rate of change? Well, it's zero. Another way to think about it is if you were to graph this function f of x equals c, well, its graph would just be a horizontal line. Okay, and what is the slope of a horizontal line? Eh, well, it's zero. Okay, and the slope of the graph, that's the derivative. Okay, well, what if your function is sine of x? Well, then I claim the derivative is cos x. Okay, and I'm going to skip over the justification. I'll talk about the justification for these other derivative rules in a minute. Derivative of cos of x, it turns out that's minus sine of x. Derivative of e to the power x, it turns out that e to the power x is very, very special. And actually, this is probably the main reason why that number e is so special. The derivative of e to the power x is just e to the power x. That function is its own derivative. Okay, so if you imagine like the graph of that function, what this means, remember the graph of e to the power x, it looks something like this. What this means in terms of the graph of that function is this, fun this graph is very, very special. It has the property that at any point on that graph, well, the y value there is exactly the same as the slope there. Okay, the y value is exactly the same as the slope, no matter what point on that graph you pick. Okay, so the function e to the power x is remarkably special once you start doing calculus, once you start, once you start taking derivatives of functions. It is its own derivative. Okay, and one final derivative rule that we're going to make use of is the derivative of the natural logarithm of x, the derivative of ln x, is just 1 over x. Okay, but where do these derivative rules come from, right? Like, I just gave you a whole bunch of just rules, and I'm telling you, hey, these, these, these are how you take derivatives. Why is that? Well, okay, so first very, very unsatisfying answer is just memorize these rules, okay? You need to know these rules. These are how we're going to be taking derivatives from now on. Okay, but sort of what's going on underneath the hood here, think back to where this power rule came from, right? In the previous lecture, we derived this power rule. We showed why this is true, and where it came from was we started off with this definition of the derivative. Remember, it's just the limit of the average rate of change over an interval as that interval width goes to zero, okay? And we just applied this definition to the function x to the power n. Okay, and we ended up getting this formula, n times x to the power n minus 1, at the end of the day, after we did a whole big long limit calculation. Okay, well you can do that exact same thing with all of these other functions. For example, if I use this definition, this limit as h goes to 0 of yada yada yada, where my function now, where my f of x is sine of x, well you can go through and you can evaluate that limit. 
the techniques to evaluate that limit are going to be a little bit more complicated than anything that we've seen so far in this course. But the answer that you're going to get at the end of the day after you simplify and cancel things out and do everything you can to make that limit easier to work with, you're going to find out that the limit equals cos of x. So in other words, the derivative equals cos of x. Okay, and similarly with all of these other functions, right? If you just plug in f of x equals e to the power x, in this definition, you're going to find that the derivative equals e to the power x as well, okay? So that's why we're allowed to use that derivative rule. We're not going to reuse the limit definition over and over and over again. It's way too much work. So we're just going to use these handily pre-made derivative rules when we want to compute derivatives. All right. So... In practice, most of the functions that we're going to want to take derivatives of, they're not just like sine x or cos x or e to the power x. In practice, they're sort of modifications of those functions. They're something like three times sine x plus e to the x, right? They're, they're different combinations of those functions, depending on what they're modeling, okay? But fortunately, that doesn't add too much of a hiccup because we have these two rules that we talked about in the previous lecture. If you want to take the derivative of f plus g, right, the derivative of a sum of two functions, you just take the derivative of the first and you add it to the derivative of the second, okay? That's all this notation means. It says derivative of the sum equals the sum of the derivatives, okay? So you can just take the derivative of them individually and then add up your answers, which is what you would probably do naively, again, if I didn't even talk about this. And similarly, with scalar multiplication, if you want to take the derivative of a scalar times f, well, you can just take the derivative of f and then multiply it by that scalar, okay? So here, c is just some number. Okay, and by combining these, these rules, we're able to take derivatives of a whole bunch of different functions now. So let's just do a bunch of examples to make sure that we're comfortable with all of these derivative rules that we've seen so far. All right, so to start off, what about this function sine of x plus 5x squared plus 3? How do we take the derivative of that? Well, just think of it as a sum of three different functions and take the derivative of those three functions individually. Derivative of sine... I just go back to my table and I remember, oh yeah, derivative of sine, that's cosine. Great. Next piece, derivative of 5x squared. Well, I know the derivative of x squared is 2x. Okay, and then I just multiply by 5. So 2x becomes 10x. The derivative of this 5x squared is 10x, right? Just think of it as you're bringing the 2 down out in front, so 5 becomes 10, and you decrease the exponent by 1, so it becomes just a 1 now. All right, and then the third function. What is the derivative of 3? Well, 3 is a constant, okay? And again, we talked about this. One of our derivative rules was derivative of a constant function is just 0, okay? So when I take the derivative, this guy just goes away. It becomes a plus 0, and, you know, just forget about it, okay? So all together, our answer at the end of the day is the derivative of this original function, sine x plus 5x squared plus 3. Now it's cos x plus 10x, okay? And then plus 0, but we don't need to write the plus 0, of course. All right, so that's our first example. Let's do another one. What is the derivative of cosine of x plus 3e to the x plus b ln x, okay? And again, the idea here is just think of it as three different functions that you're adding up. Take the derivatives of them individually, okay? So cosine of x, its derivative is minus sine x. That just comes straight from that table. 3 times e to the power x, well, again, derivative of e to the power x from the table is just itself. It's e to the power x. And then times 3 still, right? Whenever you have a scalar out in front, just leave it out in front of the derivative. So 3e e to the power x, that's still 3e e to the power x after I take the derivative. All right, sort of the, the slightly weirder term in this one is b ln x, okay? Look at what I've written here. I've said that the function is a function of x, okay? This is a single variable function. x is the only variable. This b, that's a constant. It's a parameter, Okay, so as far as the derivative is concerned, it's not changing, it's fixed. Okay, so that's a scalar. So what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm just gonna do b times the derivative of ln x. And again, I just look at my table, derivative, derivative of ln x is one over x. So I just get b times that, I get b divided by x. Okay, so again, at the end of the day, you just add up these three individual derivatives that we computed, and you just get this expression here, the derivative of the overall function. It's minus sine x plus 3e to the x plus b over x. All right, let's do another example. Okay, well, what is the derivative of f of x equals e to the power r minus bx? Okay, and again, like there's a lot of letters here, okay, but most of these are constants or parameters, right? Again, this is a single variable function, okay? The only variable here is x, okay? Everything else is constant. Everything else is just a parameter of that function. So e, well, that's just that 
you know, standard fixed number 2.7182818828, yada, 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 are that, I mean, I don't know its particular value. No one's told me what it is, but again, it's a parameter. It's fixed. It's a constant. Okay. So it does not change as X changes. And similarly for B here, no one's told me what it is, but it's not X. It doesn't depend on X. It's a constant or a parameter. So when I take the derivative of this function here, well, I start off, take the derivative of this first piece, but that first piece, that whole thing is a constant, right? Remember, r is a constant. So what's e to the power r? Well, it's just 2.7 whatever raised to the power r. That doesn't change as x changes. There's no x's in there. So it's still just a constant. So this first piece here, when I take its derivative, is zero, okay? And then the second piece, when I take its derivative, well, x, think of x as x to the power one, Okay, so what happens when you take its derivative is that one comes out in front and it becomes x to the power zero. It's one times x to the power zero, which is just the number one. Okay, so when I use my power rule on that, what's gonna happen is, okay, e to the power r becomes zero and minus bx, that just becomes minus b. The derivative of x itself is just one. All right, what if we flip things around a little bit though? What if instead of f of x equals this formula, what if we considered it as a function of r? Okay, what if it was f of r equals e to the power r minus bx? So it's the same formula, except now we're not considering x to be the variable. Now we're considering r to be the variable. Okay, and what happens now is when we take the derivative, now we're thinking of r as the variable, so that's the thing that's changing. So that's, what we, that's the piece that we have to use our derivative rules are on. e to the power r, what's the derivative of that? Well, it's just e to the power r. And then minus bx, what's the derivative of that? With respect to r, how much does minus bx change as r changes? Well, it doesn't change at all as r changes. This minus bx is now a constant because it doesn't depend on r. Okay, so what happens now when we take the derivative? We get the derivative of f of r is just e to the power r, okay? Because our variable now is r instead of x. Okay, so always, always, always keep in mind that derivatives they depend on what your variable is, okay? The derivative is always with respect to some variable. It's a rate of change with respect to a variable. It measures how quickly the function changes as the input variable changes, okay? If your input variable is x, then this is how quickly the function changes. But if your input variable is r, then this is how quickly the function changes, okay? So it depends on what you're thinking of as your variable when you take the derivative. Alrighty, so that'll do it for all of our sort of laundry list of derivative rules. What we're going to do next class is we're going to look at, well, what happens if instead of just adding and subtracting and scalar multiplying functions, what if you combine them in more exotic ways? What if I take a function and multiply it by another function? What happens to the derivative of that product of two functions? Or similarly with division, if I have a function divided by another function, how do I compute the derivative of that whole big function now? All right, so we'll do that next lecture and I'll see you then.